I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. A few days after being ordained a deacon, I was on my way to the Dawson Synod office for a meeting. And I was crossing through downtown, right down by the BMO Tower, when I came upon a man who was sitting along the side of a building, clearly in need, hungry. I went up to him and I started to talk with the man. He and I had this conversation and as we did, I asked the man, what is your name? And the man said, Michael. We start talking more. And I finally said to him, what do you need? And he said, I need nothing. You've done enough for me. And I was perplexed. What do you mean, I've done enough for you? He said, you asked me my name. He said, I sit here day after day and not a single person will call me by name. No one knows me. Needless to say, as you can imagine, I walked away, I thought I was going to cry. <laughs> Here's this human person. No one knew him. All he wanted was to be called by name. You and I are very familiar with the story of the Good Samaritan. In fact, it's probably one of the most well-known narratives within the Gospels. The problem is, we know it too well. And often we miss the real heart of the story. In fact, we even have laws that are named for this parable. The Good Samaritan Laws. Laws which encourage us to do whatever we can to help persons who are in need of immediate help, such as what we saw this past week in Mississauga when the man whose car went off the roadside and burst into flames and heroes went running to it. The thing is, the story's more than that. This is not a story about heroes. This is not a story about us only helping when people need immediate aid. This story is about our neighbor. Who is our neighbor? Now you might not have caught it as you listened to the story, but there's a curious line and a curious question that comes up in the story today. So we had this lawyer. The lawyer would have known the law very, very well. In fact, clearly him asking Jesus, what must I do to gain eternal life? He, the lawyer is intentionally trying to trick Jesus. He's trying to put Jesus to the test. He knows very well what he must do. He knows that all the law and the prophets hang upon these two principles. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. That everyone knew at that time. So right from the beginning, the lawyer is intentionally trying to antagonize Jesus. He's trying to put him into a fight. But Jesus, ever so gentle, repeats the law to him. He says, this is what you must do. But then, the lawyer asks a very curious question. And Luke says that he, wishing to justify himself, Ask Jesus, who is my neighbor? Now the meaning of that might pass us over, but in Judaism, the whole idea of justification is quite important. Justify means to make yourself right with God and right with each other. So the man right away says, who is my neighbor? Who must I love in order to gain eternal life? It's a curious question. Can you imagine? Because immediately it asks a negative. It's not a positive. The man simply wants to say, what must I minimally, minimally do? 
Who are the only people that I need to love in order to get to eternal life? Can you imagine? Can you imagine if Mark, our rector's warden, got up and said, who among this congregation must I actually really love in order to be a good rector's warden? He might think that sometimes. <laughs> But this is what the guy is doing. He's trying to ask Jesus. He's saying, well, okay, I, love, I get this whole idea of loving your neighbor as yourself, but I'm not quite comfortable with what that means. I need you to qualify this for me, Jesus. I need you to make this easier so I can be right before God and before my neighbors. I want to do the very bare minimum. So Jesus really challenges him. He gives three characters who go by a man who's been beaten and robbed. The first two, the priest and the Levite, surely would have been the ones that should have done what was right because they did know the law. They lived the law. But like the lawyer, they only wanted to love those whom they saw as justified before God. And in their eyes, the man was beaten, probably bloody. So for many of them, at that time, by the way, if you touch somebody who was bleeding, you would have to be purified afterwards. So the two clearly did not want to touch him because if they did, they would have to go through the purification rituals. But the one who actually helps is the Samaritan. Now, Samaritan at the time, Samaritans were persons that were Jewish in their faith, although they were a group of Jews that were not exiled during the Assyrian captivity. So Israel was captured at two different times in its history, first by the Assyrians and later by the Babylonians. They were a group that remained within the land, and as such the religious practice was much more similar to that of a more ancient form of Judaism than others. And so the predominant Jewish community did not actually consider them to be proper Jews. And in fact, they even believed in some very weird beliefs, which the Jewish community did not believe as well, such as resurrection. So for the larger Jewish community, the Samaritans were people with whom you did not associate yourself with. Because if you did, you yourself would become unclean. But who gets the law? The Samaritan. The one whom the lawyer, the priest, the Levite, the one whom all the righteous people, all the good people thought was bad, was the one who was actually justified before God. This story isn't so much about running into the fire or running into dangerous situations. This story is a story about who do you see as your neighbor? Are you going to truly love everyone? Or do you make distinction among the people with whom you associate? Now, I'm sure most of us would like to think of ourselves as good people. I know I do. We try to think of ourselves as inclusive, as welcoming, as inviting to all. But I bet you, if we were honest with ourselves, we likely exclude others. Perhaps we exclude people because they don't share our same political belief. Perhaps we exclude people because this is my church, and this church is always going to be my way, and don't you dare introduce anything new to my church. Or maybe we don't associate with people because of who they are and what they do. Or maybe we decide which neighborhood to live in because the people look like us, have the money like us. The yards are perfect and clean. This story really ought to unsettle us. It really, if it doesn't make you uncomfortable, it should. And if it doesn't make you uncomfortable, you're missing the point. 
Because quite frankly, Jesus is saying to you and to I, every human being, every human person is your neighbor without qualification and without distinction. You and I must love all and we must be open to all. We must be willing to listen, to sit, and to talk, and to get to know each other by name. I think we as a church have a grand opportunity before us, and the story can be an inspiration for that. You and I live in a day and an age in which the world is so radically polarized. It's getting so dangerously polarized that countries are in verge of civil and revolutionary wars. There's much talk that the country south of us may enter into a civil war in coming years. All because of the divisiveness. All because people are unwilling to sit and listen to each other, to talk with each other. Instead, people put up walls. Churches are being torn because people don't necessarily want to sit and talk and listen. We only want to sit with those whom we like to be our neighbors. We are much more like the lawyer than the good Samaritan. But Jesus is saying, no, you and I must love all. Not just in words, not just in philosophy, but truly love and get to know each other. So I'm going to give you a challenge, actually. And you can start right here in the church. Do you find yourself sitting only with those persons whom you like? Then try to get to know somebody else. Do you avoid somebody here because they challenge you or make you uncomfortable? Then sit with them. Because perhaps where you're being challenged and made uncomfortable is a place where you need conversion. Do you stop when you walk along the street and ask the beggar their name? Do you try to get to know them for who they are? This is what Jesus is calling us to do. It isn't about racing into buildings to save a person or breaking windows in cars to save somebody in trial. But yes, those are good. It's much more fundamental than that. It's about entering into relationship with all, regardless whether or not we like them. We are called to be in relationship with all. Amen.